My name is uh, Sami Dolachahi. I am a, a plastic surgeon um, that works uh, within the orthopedic department at Beth Israel, and I'm the director of the orthoplastic um, program at our hospital. And uh, I'm delighted to present uh, today a, a topic that is uh, near and dear to me, which is lower extremity reconstruction. Uh, and uh, this is kind of our agenda for today. I'm going to give a brief historical perspective. Uh, we'll talk about principles. I think that's probably the most important part of this. Uh, and specifically, the what we call in plastic surgery, the reconstructive ladder. Um, we're going to focus on two uh, different flaps that um, you should be hopefully comfortable uh, performing. Uh, and then uh, I'm just going to touch on two additional topics just to maintain the perspective. Uh, we'll talk about refinement procedures and also and some nerve surgery. And that's a picture of us in the OR, the place I like to be the most, uh, with one of our microsurgery fellows doing a, a procedure. So just a brief historical perspective. And if you really look at um, extremity salvage and reconstruction, this goes way back, um, uh, many thousand years. Even Hippocrates himself discussed uh, amputation for gangrene. Uh, Ambrose Paré, who was a French surgeon, um, uh, talked about you know, amputation techniques, uh, some of which we use today. And what is remarkable, I find, when you keep going into the history and keep going forward, talking about debridement, uh, and then uh, fracture stabilization, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The remarkable thing is a lot of these advances took place uh, during times of war. And these seem to have been real transition periods in surgery, but specifically in extremity reconstruction, upper and lower limb reconstruction. And uh, that uh, really stands out to me. Of interest to me personally is also Erich Lexer, who uh, I went to the medical school, to medical school in, in uh, Freiburg in Germany, and he was a faculty member there uh, many years before I was there. And uh, he was really a pioneer also in extremity reconstruction and came up with many, many uh, innovative techniques, some of which we use today uh, without really understanding where, where they came from. And, um, uh, and, you know, there are so many really wonderful uh, books. Um, this is one I, I discovered a few years ago on the left. This was published uh, during World War II, and it's entitled Principles and Practice of War Surgery by Chureta. And it's really remarkable how much you can find out there about um, some uh, interesting techniques to manage extremity wounds, uh, compound fractures, and so forth, some of the principles of which I've been able to adopt in my practice. Uh, specifically as they pertain, for instance, to soft tissue immobilization and its role in wound healing. And on the right, this is a book I suggest um, you try and find. Um, it's a wonderful book that talks about muscle and muscular cutaneous flaps. This was published in the 80s and they uh, do circulate. So I'm sure you can uh, get hold of one of these. And a lot of the pictures I'll show you about the technique of harvesting these muscle flaps are described in this book. And I think this is probably one of the best books for muscle flaps. Uh, orthoplastic surgery, I, I, I mentioned the term earlier, and I'm not sure if you've heard of this, but it essentially is the uh, marriage or the bringing together of principles of orthopedic and plastic surgery to manage difficult problems. And uh, this is you know, certainly not a new field, um, but it, the term orthoplastic surgery is rather new. Uh, because there are many surgeons now around the world that are focused uh, on this area. Uh, I think that one of the origins uh, of orthoplastic surgery is actually comes from hand surgery. Uh, because if you go back and see um, how Dr. Bunnell contributed to the field of hand surgery, he really stressed the importance of bringing together multiple specialties uh, and expertise to provide adequate care to upper extremity patients. And I think these principles apply to the lower extremity as well. I am a hand surgeon, I'm fellowship trained in hand surgery, and 
a lot of what I've learned in hand surgery actually helps me take care of these lower extremity reconstruction patients. So let's talk about principles of lower extremity reconstruction. First of all, obviously, we're gonna go into details of soft tissue coverage, but I want to just remind us all that the initial trauma management and patient stabilization is critical. And I should probably forego initial because really when we are considering a salvage of a limb, or further complex reconstruction, uh, we still need to keep in mind any other systemic issues that the patient has. It's very possible that a patient, although uh, presenting with a rather straightforward issue, is uh, unstable and is not a candidate for reconstruction and amputation is the right answer. And this is something we encounter at our medical center every so often um, that this is the case. Uh, and I caution you, um, to just focus uh, on the uh, limb. And as the expression goes, life before limb, so the, the patient's life is, is more important. And that's something we should not forget. The second major principle is the importance of soft tissue debridement. And I will say this again, because I think um, this is often missed. So soft tissue debridement, so cleaning out devitalized tissue is the cornerstone of, believe it or not, extremity reconstruction, upper and lower. So it can be a, a situation where multiple trips to the OR are necessary to get the soft tissues cleaned out. Ideally, a radical initial debridement um, is uh, helpful because if you think about it, you have a compound fracture, some open fracture of a lower extremity, let's say a tibia, a tip fib open fracture, lots of devitalized soft tissue and degloving. And no matter how beautifully you manage the bony injury, if you have not debrided and cleaned this wound out well and provided soft tissue coverage, if any of this gets infected, since devitalized tissue is a perfect breeding ground for a bacteria, um, you're in trouble. You may lose the limb um, or you may, if you don't do a good debridement, you'll have to go back to the operating room five or six times. And after week two or three, everything is heavily colonized and you've lost your chance. Your hardware is infected, you're done. So um, it's good to do a good initial debridement. It's better to do a very radical debridement. If you learn to assess soft tissue and see what's good and what's not, I think that's probably um, uh, where experience comes in, but it's something to, um, to learn early on in your training. And last but not least, soft tissue reconstruction. So really the first two things, um, I probably spend most of my energy on doing those first two things and the soft tissue techniques themselves um, uh, come as then a third step. <clears throat> this is a term, reconstructive bladder, that is very... Uh, well-known to plastic surgeons, maybe less um, uh, to orthopedic surgeons, but this is key. So whenever you think about a wound, you want to uh, think about like the most simple option for reconstruction and then leading up to the more complex. There is uh, now a <clears throat> group of us that talk about the reconstructive elevator. So you know, you may go all the way up to a flap as opposed to considering any other option because you think that's the best solution for the specific problem. But I would advocate that we think in this manner here. Um, so a ladder, a real a reconstructed ladder going from simple to more complex. So let's start with the most simple secondary intention, right? Just that means you just let the wound do whatever it's doing and heal on its own. This is a surgical incision on the calf of a young woman. Um, uh, and uh, we see here that there is some necrotic skin and there's some dehiscence. So this incision is in trouble. Uh, how do you solve this problem? Well, you think about the reconstructive ladder. So I start from the simple to the most complex, you know, and the most simple is secondary intention. Does this wound qualify to be healed? Yes. So what I'm doing now is actually I'm having the patient paint the wound with betadine or iodine paint twice a day to let it desiccate and just basically scab and heal on its own. Um, 
from the inside out by secondary induction. If you look at the reason I, I really like um, this uh, diagram on the side, it shows a couple of interesting things. So <clears throat> it shows on the right side is healing by secondary intention. This is healing by primary intention, that is to say primary closure. Um, the secondary intention you see here, you start with a big wound and it contracts and contracts, becomes smaller and epithelializes. It's actually a very accurate image because it shows how the skin thins and so forth. So when we talk about healing by secondary intention, don't forget that the wound doesn't just heal, it actually contracts as well. So we have myofibroblasts that come in and the wound actually becomes smaller. And so you can use secondary intention healing to your advantage. You may be thinking, okay, I'm gonna eventually graft this patient, but maybe letting it heal by secondary intention will allow the wound to become smaller, contract, and then you can put a skin graft on it. So don't, don't forget wound contraction is a tool you can use for your patients. The left side shows primary closure. And if you look here, secondary intention was the first step of the ladder. Next step is primary closure. So first step, you know, healing secondary, you do nothing. Just let it heal. Primary closure is you actually suture it shut. Obviously, that's what we prefer. If you can get a wound closed, you look, I mean, you get minimal scarring. You see here, compared to secondary intention, a nice clean wound. Obviously, if you have hardware exposed or something, you're definitely going to want to uh, close primarily if you can. But primary closure is not always just as simple as this. Um, these are just some examples of secondary intention. So this is a patient who um, had orthopedic hardware removed, had a flap done 20 years ago. And um, the surgeon went in uh, without any regard and just took the hardware out and everything died. So the part of the flap after 20 years died. And we see here exposed structures. Uh, the patient, incidentally, was found, I ordered vascular studies, had a vascular issue that was fixed, and then the wounded healing on its own. This was a few weeks ago, and I actually saw this patient last week, and almost everything is covered over with granulation tissue. And I show this because you can see clearly the skin healing from the sides, epithelialization from the wound margins, granulation tissue coming in, some wound contraction happening. And uh, this is another example of healing by secondary intention. So you have, uh, this is an elderly patient, 99 year old female, ankle fracture dislocation, that gets fixed. This is the wound initially, you wash it out, you approximate it, and we leave this open. We leave this area to heal on its own. This is the patient three weeks later, I just saw her in the office, everything is healing. You have a little granulation tissue, but the rest is all healed over. And in about two weeks, this should be totally closed. So, you know, Boston, 21st century, we're doing healing by secondary intention when indicated. This is another example, healing by secondary intention on burns on the feet and on the hands. We really prefer to let these heal. Look at this. It heals beautifully. And after a few weeks, this wound is epithelialized. Um, I mentioned earlier primary closure. It sounds like very basic, but well, primary closure can be a little bit more sophisticated than we think. So this is a patient with degloving. I took care of as a resident 10 years ago. This is in the emergency room. I did not take the patient to the operating room. Pure soft tissue degloving injury, almost a Lavalet kind of thing going on here. This is the area of undermining. In the emergency room under local anesthesia, I washed it out. This shows the undermining. I closed it. Uh, this shows you the dimensions, and I put drains in. Suction drain here, suction drain here. So put the dressing on. This is what it looked like, and all we lost after a few weeks was this area. Everything else healed. So just to go back to this, don't forget that just putting the skin together is often not enough. You have to be smart. So you have to debride what's devitalized, and then also what makes sense is to put drains in because you have a very large dead space and to allow this to heal as it did without the drains, you would have most likely lost a lot more and possibly would have had infection from a seroma getting infected. So don't forget that primary closure um, uh, can be a little bit more um, thought provoking and sophisticated than we sell it to be. <clears throat> 
So this, although we lost some skin here, is still a home run because you know you preserved the majority of the patient's uh, skin envelope. So if we go back to our diagram, the next step is a skin graph. And uh, you know there's a full thickness versus a split thickness skin graph here. It shows you the difference. So obviously, full thickness is the entirety of the skin. Split is just the top portion of the skin. Basically, a slit graph is through the dermis, something through the dermis. If you were asking what is the average thickness, I would just say 15,000th of an inch. If you set your dermatome um, to, to, uh, to 15, that's, that harvests the graft at 15,000th of an inch. If you have one of these, there's a WEC, there's a Watson, there's a lot of wonderful um, harvesting devices that you can use instead of a dermatome. And with these devices, you can get a, a great graft um, that you can then either mesh or not, and then put it on the wound. So this is an example of a patient who, you know, conventionally around the ankle, you'd think of a flap. This patient had grossly exposed bone and tendon. And, um, and actually the, the uh, tibial nerve was exposed, but the patient was very sick. And I decided, okay, I'm not gonna do a flap. So we just put a skin graft and you can get away with this sort of thing. And the way you get away with it in an area where there's a lot of motion is by immobilizing the patient. Think back to that war textbook I showed you by Chueta from the 1940s. They talk about immobilization to allow this sort of graft to heal around joints. And you can do it. Um, I mean, it's not ideal to put a graft on bone, but in this case, we put an X-fix on. I could have certainly just put a delta frame and done something more simple. That's probably what I would do today. Uh, but um, it worked out well. You see the result. Look at the ankle motion, extension, flexion at the ankle, and you can see this video here. So actually, um, you can get away with a simple skin graft sometimes, and this is the result again. How pliable it is, it actually softens up. This is after about a year, and you can see here, that it can actually do very well. And there, that shows the ankle motion. This is another example of a skin graft on exposed structures. Exposed bone, here the tibia was exposed, and here the tendon was exposed, and look at the result of this. So good motion, everything's healed, patient's doing well. So that was skin graft. Now we move up the complexity to flaps, okay? Now I want to talk briefly about pedicle flaps. What is, if you're not a plastic surgeon, you're not thinking about this every day. So I'm gonna try and explain this. So pedicle flap, it means it has a pedicle. It means it's still attached to wherever the blood supply is coming from. As opposed to a free flap, which you separate from the patient, put it on the back table and then reattach it by attaching the blood vessels. This is a pedicle flap. And pedicle can be local. This is a muscle flap, a gastroc flap, which we'll talk about. It can be distant. This is a patient's abdomen. This is the wrist. I attached the wrist to the abdomen for three weeks, and then I separated, and that reconstructed the wound. So uh, think about it. Again, these are considered old-fashioned things, but they really aren't. There's absolutely a role for pedicle, even distant flaps. And in the lower extremity, there is such thing as a flap where you take it from one leg and put it on the other, um, a cross leg flap, as we call it. And that's a very good option too. I'm not talking about that today, but that is also considered a pedicle flap. And the next step up, oh, this is another example of pedicle flap I did this weekend. I thought I would add this to the pictures just to show you. Um, <clears throat> this is a young lady with exposed tendon. She had an infection. She was transferred from a different hospital. And all I did was, I couldn't put a graft on here because the structures were there and, and it was too deep and so forth. So I just made a counter incision, created a bipedicle flap. So this is a pedicle, but it's a local flap attached. I did not detach it. I moved it over. I closed that and I put a graft here. It's called a bipedicle flap. And then the last stage is free flap. This is a foot. You know, you've got all this exposed. Um, and then you just take a piece of tissue with the blood vessel, you put it on the back table, it's totally separate, it's free, quote unquote free, and then you reattach it down here, hook up the vessels, and you've got a free flap. 
Uh, now, the, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, I want to focus on uh, these two areas. So the knee area, the proximal third, and the middle third. And we talk about rule of thirds in plastic surgery. So if I get a call from you and you say, Sammy, I have this patient with an exposed tibia on the distal third of the leg, already my mind is going towards a free flap. So anything distal third foot, we really often think about free flaps because there's not a lot of tissue laxity there. There's not a lot of local flap options or pedicle flaps. So that's an area where we really think about free flaps. And I'm not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about knee proximal third and middle third. Because if I get a call about one of these and someone tells me there's a proximal third defect of tibia, the first thing I think about is a, a, is a gastroc flap, which we'll talk about. So the rule of thirds is it really still applies. And these are the areas we're going to focus on today. So, you know, the proximal third and knee, it can be really variable. This is an elective case. Patient shows up in the office with a draining sinus. It can be, uh, you know, this sort of thing with an infected knee. It could be this. Your colleagues call you to the OR and you've, you've got this huge hole with a big defect. So it can be really elective down to like more urgent uh, indications. So presentation is variable. The workhorse flap for proximal third and knee is the gastrocnemius muscle flap. That is the workhorse for all, the, all these um, proximal third and knee defects. I've even managed uh, pictures of this, which I'm not showing you. I have pictures of a gastroc flap. I was able to cover a femur, like a distal third femur osteomyelitis. So this is a very, very helpful flap to have in your arm and term, but it's very easy to uh, dissect. So let's talk about the gastrocnemius. Uh, flap. Um, the blood supply is, it has one major blood vessel. It comes from the popliteal artery and the medial gastrocnemius muscle shown here, medial and lateral, two heads, has a, comes, gets blood supply from the medial sural artery. The lateral gastrocnemius gets uh, blood from the lateral sural artery. Don't mix it up with the sural nerve. This is separate. So, uh, lateral and medial sural artery. That is the main blood supply. So this makes it what we call a Mathis and the high type one muscle. There's one dominant vascular pedicle. That's all that means. Um, the innervations from the tibial nerve, the origin is, as you are aware, the medial and lateral epicondyle of the femur, and the insertion is at the calcaneal tuberosity, right? This is part of the triceps surae. Um, the reason I'm showing this picture here is to show you that the medial head of the gastroc is usually longer and wider. So the reason why we mostly use the medial gastrocnemius muscle as a flap is because of this particular reason right here. And you see it in this anatomical depiction. Also, the medial is longer and wider than the lateral. Um, and it's also shown here. The relevant anatomy. So if you look at the median lateral heads of the gastroc, right underneath it is the plantaris tendon. This is one way you can confirm in surgery that you're, you've got the right muscle. And it sounds very basic and silly, but you can really mess this up. And uh, I know of a case where a patient was getting a medial gastroc muscle flap harvested and the, the surgeon cut the tibial nerve. So this can happen. Uh, it shouldn't happen. So knowing what landmarks to look for, one of them is the plantaris. If I am harvesting this flap, I always look for the plantaris. And it is, it is there in mo more often than not. Uh, I have actually yet to see a patient that doesn't have one when I'm doing a flap. I guess I just got lucky, but I always look for it because I want to see this. That confirms to me I'm in the right tissue plane between the gastrocnemius muscle and the soleus muscle, which is underneath. Other important anatomical landmarks, here you have the sural nerve, right here, between the medial and the lateral heads of the gastroc. I also look for that. I also look for the blue structure, the vein that runs with the sural nerve, which is the lesser saphenous or small saphenous, Latin saphena pava vein, which also indicates you're in the right plane. So these are all the things I look for when I'm doing a medial gastrocnemius muscle flap. And it's very simple, all you do is you cut the, the, uh, at the tendon level or muscular tendon junction. I just cut a little lower. You cut here, 
and then you dissect the tissue plane between the medial and lateral heads of the gastroc. I look at the uh, uh, sural nerve in the process. I make sure I've got the plantaris tendon there, so I'm, I'm happy I've got the right muscle. And they dissect it up, and that's it. All done. And this muscle will swing in many different places. I'll show you. Some surgeons describe dividing the origin of the gastrocnemius muscle from the femur. I would suggest you do not do this. It can be done, but you get into danger zone here in the popliteal fossa. And uh, I have also experienced cases where the blood vessel into the gastrocnemius muscle, the medial sural artery, was injured in the process of detaching the muscle from the femur. I would suggest, unless you're an expert at gastrocnemius collapse, do not do that. You don't have to do that. How do you harvest the flap? What incision do you use? So we know, in theory, if you're in a cadaver lab, I know I cut it there, I cut it here. Now, how do you approach the gastrocnemius muscle? There are four ways. Number one, you go through the wound that you're dealing with already. You just go through your existing wound. Simple. Second option, you make an incision on the medial cap. Third option, you make a midline posterior incision. The last option is endoscopic. And I'm going to show you pictures of these. This is a patient who underwent replacement of the proximal tibia. And you see here that the orthopedic oncologist made a big incision. And all I did was literally, through that exposure, find the anatomy that I just told you about. So I looked for the most superficial muscle in the superficial posterior compartment. This is medial, this is lateral, medially. I found the plantaris tendon and I went and took the muscle. I cut it this little, I cut the midline, I dissected it up, you see here, separated it from the lateral gastroc, brought it up and that's it, done. So I didn't have to make any additional incisions. It covered it very nicely, no problem. This is another orthopedic oncology example. The reason I, I'm, I'm showing this is because in orthopedic oncology, the exposures are quite extensile, and often you don't need to make additional incisions. Here's another example. You find the muscle, you divide it, you bring it up, you swing it over, and you close the wound. This shows you um, the uh, muscle here. I also did extensor mechanism reconstruction with a tendon graft. And uh, that's, that's what this image shows. It shows you how kind of the tendon graft is woven into the gastroc, and it's just a little trick. And uh, this is another example. Now I'm gonna show you, this one is an example of the flap being harvested from a separate incision. So this is the defect. This is the draining sinus, antibiotic space where it's placed. And then I come in and you see now we're looking at the leg from the medial side. This is the wound. I make an incision here medial calf, right? This is technique number two, medial calf incision. Medial calf, and I dissect the muscle, sh shuttle it through. I leave a little skin bridge here. I'll show that to you again. I leave a skin bridge here. You can also just cut right through, but then you pull the muscle through and you're done. Very simple. And then, you know, you close what you can primarily. Again, reconstructive ladder, right? Primary closure. And then here we put the muscle flap, a skin graft on top, done. This is another example of a gastroc flap through a medial, medial calf incision. Medial calf, gastroc muscle right here, very simple. You find it distal, you cut it, you separate it. Here you can see this, the lateral gastrocnemius muscle. It's still very muscular here. If you think it's a very clean tendon between the two, it's not. It's sometimes muscle, and you have to go through it. And here you swing it up, cover the hardware, done. And then you close what you can, again, reconstructive ladder, primary closure, primary closure, and then here we put a graft. There's a little trick I wanna mention here. This is a very large, I mean, consider the size of this defect. Okay, this is, we're talking from the insertion of the patellar tendon to probably the mid tibia. I used one gastrocnemius muscle for this patient. This is a female patient. And the way I did this, I got this to work, is I scored the fascia. You can see here, you see the tendon, the undersurface of the muscle. You can make hash marks in it with a 15 blade. It has to be sharp. I use five blades to do this because it has to be perfectly sharp. You can't use a dull blade. And you can score it and it spreads out beautifully and you can cover this huge defect. 
with this. Now, the option three for the gastrocnemius flap is a midline posterior incision. This shows you the incision, midline posterior. This shows you in the OR. Now, this is why I don't like this. Look at the position you're holding. Someone needs to hold the leg up and you are basically making this incision and working upside down. Uh, and that's why I'm not a fan of this. It makes the dissection very easy because you can see the midline raffe between the median lateral. You can see the sural nerve. It's very easy. But the exposure is tough. The other reason I caution you from doing this is when you rehab postoperatively, the patient will be laying on the incision, right? It's a posterior incision. Typically, the patient lays on their back, their supine post-op, and they're going to lay on this so you can get a pressure uh, injury to this and it can make the wound heal in a delayed fashion. But look what you get. So through this midline posterior incision, uh, both medial and lateral muscles were harvested, both medial and lateral gastro, and you bring it forward and look how much you can cover. You can cover the whole knee um, with the medial and lateral. But look at the lateral, how small it is. Look at the medial, how big it is. Technique four is endoscopic. And if you have um, an abdominal scope in your hospital, you can do this. Uh, this is a young lady with a sarcoma that was sized, radiated. You can see here for the tattoo marks. So it's a big exposed wound. And we harvest it using the camera. So you can see me harvesting. We published this in the Journal of Orthoplastic Surgery. But it, it, it just gives you an idea of what you can do and how versatile this muscle flap is. So we actually didn't make any incisions. We just harvested it with the endoscope and tunneled it and parachuted it in. And there you go, the wound is closed. Uh, one thing I want to show you is the muscle is still innervated. So this is a patient who's two years out. And you can see here a couple of things. You can see that this is the gastroc and the serrations of the muscle. And you can actually see him when he, um, I guess the video is not working, but you can see that when, uh, when he would contract his calf, you can actually see this all move. So we typically don't denervate it. You can, I wouldn't, because it's, uh, it puts you at risk of injuring the blood supply, but you can. And some, some patients, this bothers them. Um, and then there are complications. You know, this is a patient that did medial and lateral gastrocnemius flaps. She broke down here. And I just reopened her and think about the reconstructive ladder again, primary closure. I just closed her. I just undermined the skin, brought it together and obtained a primary closure. I left the muscle flaps alone. So don't forget. And this is a case where I couldn't cover the whole knee joint with the muscle and the skin graft. I could only cover part of it. The rest I put a skin graft and I came back very easy and I just excised this segment uh, later on and uh, closed it again primarily. Uh, just a few seconds of a pause and then we're going to talk about the soleus flap. And um, so now we're transitioning from the knee and proximal third to the middle third of the leg, the lower leg. The workhorse here is a soleus flap. So this is the rest. So you realize the tricep surae is very useful. We use these muscles readily for lower extremity reconstruction. The soleus flap is more complicated. Why? Because it has a, a, a very um, uh, diverse blood supply from multiple different vessels. This is a Matheson high type two muscle flap. So it has a primary blood supply from the popliteal artery and then it's got a secondary blood supply. And the muscle is, is, receives blood supply from the popliteal artery, posterior tubular artery, and perineal artery. What does this tell you? This tells you that you can't take the entire muscle based on one vessel like we did the medial gastro or lateral gastro. You can't do that, unfortunately. So you have to be a little bit more careful when you use this one. The innervation, like the gastroc, is the tibial nerve as well. The soleus muscle is visible underneath here. So this is the medial lateral gastroc. This is all soleus. So it already tells you why you can reconstruct the middle third, right? 
this is more proximal in the, in the lower leg, this is kind of in the middle. So it makes sense that you can reconstruct a middle third defect with the soleus, very logical. In terms of its blood supply, again, it receives direct branches from the popliteal artery. This is the primary blood supply of this muscle. And then it also receives some branches from the perineal and a lot of small branches from the posterior tibial artery. And this is why when you think about this, if the blood supply is primarily from here, this is why cutting it here and moving this part of the muscle down to the ankle is not a reliable option. It can be done, it has been reported, but it's not a reliable option. The more reliable option is to leave the, the blood supply from here and cut it down here and then swing it around. This is an image from a week ago. I was in the popliteal fossa for a different reason. And I just thought this is a nice example. This is proximal, this is distal, this is the tibial, tibial nerve. This is the gastrocnemius, the medial gastrocnemius. This is the lateral gastrocnemius, this is the soleus. You can see here very nicely the, um, the innervation. This is a very large nerve going into the soleus right here and the blood supply coming in, which is very large, large branches going in. And this is coming off the popliteal artery. This is the primary blood supply to the soleus. This is what we're looking right up here. I really like these images. I found these in the um, Atlas of Muscle Flaps that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. And I think these are the best pictures of a, gap, of a soleus muscle flap harvest. Basically, this simulates the defect in the middle third of the tibia or middle third of the lower leg. You make a, an incision here that curves posteriorly. Through this approach, you first thing you find is gastroc muscle, our friend from earlier. You find the soleus muscle and look at this, the plantaris. So that's how you know you're in the right tissue plane. We usually harvest this flap by cutting the soleus muscle approximately where the plantaris crosses over. You see there's this intersection here between um, the soleus and the plantaris. This is approximately where I usually try and, and divide my flap distally. So that's why I'm showing you that. You pull the gastrocnemius muscle, the medial, medial gastrocnemius muscle over towards you, and you're looking right down at this beautiful soleus muscle. Plantaris is here, you're safe. You cut the soleus muscle distally to separate it from the triceps surae. And then you also cut along the anterior border of the soleus muscle. Here, there are little vessels that you have to be aware of, but you can coagulate them. This is a small perforator. You clip that or coagulate that, you're fine. You dissect along the anterior border and the distal insertion. And this is what you get. This is your soleus muscle. This is the distal end cut. You cut the anterior border off the tibia here. And um, here you see the posterior tibial artery running along, right? Those are all the way down to the ankle. And look at this big branch that is still attached. This is exactly the way I do it. So you can cut this in theory if you had to, because we saw earlier, I'm gonna go back a couple of slides, that the main blood supply is coming from the popliteal fossa here, big vessels coming off the popliteal artery. So in theory, you can divide all these other vessels, but in practical terms, we don't do that. We leave as much blood supply as we can. So if you can get this muscle to go over there and close your wound without dividing these, what we call minor pedicles from the posterior tibial artery, just leave them alone. Definitely leave them alone. That just improves your blood flow. And look, here you go, the muscle flap is in place. These are pictures that show you how far it can go. So you take the, the soleus based proximally and you can put it across, you can go down, you can go backwards, you know, towards the Achilles, you can go down towards the ankle. So it's a very versatile uh, flap. Uh, this, these are some examples where I've used this. And these are what I call my triple quadruple flap limb salvages. So it's like you have multiple multi-level and you need to be very creative on how to fix this. So you see here, um, distal third, middle third, and proximal third. 
You see here, I use the gas drop flap for this part. I use the soleus flap for this. I use the free flap for the distal part. This shows you the free flap hooked up into the posterior tubal vessels here. And like that, we managed to salvage that limb. This is another example. I'm just flying through this just to show you. This is another leg, gastro flap, soleus, and then a free flap for the ankle. So triple flap. Uh, another example, multi-level injury, a 5,000 pound boulder fell onto this woman's leg. Um, ankle injury, you see the pins here, uh, tibia. So um, we use the gastro flap for this. I use the soleus flap for this part, and then I put a free flap on the foot. Uh, these are just some images. This is the free flap, very bulky. Uh, and then this is what it looked like. Um, so these are the gastroc soleus flaps. This is the free flap on the ankle. I did the liposuction, thinned it out, and this is her two, three weeks ago. She's three years out and doing well. And you can see everything healed. Um, um, a few words about peripheral nerve. So <clears throat> we've talked now about principles. We've talked about the two workhorse flaps, the soleus and the gastroc flap. And I want to mention a few things about nerve. So we're, we're thinking, we're, we tend to be very focused on bone, soft tissue, but we forget the peripheral nerve. This is really important. Why? Because you have a peripheral nerve injury, you get three things. Not just weakness, as you would think, because you have lack of motor function, numbness, anesthesia, pain is the problem. You know, this is probably one of the most debilitating things that we tend to ignore. So don't ignore the peripheral nerve. System. This is a patient had a gastroc flap, a soleus muscle flap, chronic pain. And in this patient, we dissected out the, um, the saphenous nerve and denervated this part, and that helped with the pain. And we uh, cut it and did what we call targeted muscle renovation, where you just attach the nerve into a, a muscle branch. It's very easy to do. You don't need a microscope. You don't need microinsurance. This is a very easy thing that can be learned readily. Or nerve compression. Not infrequently, you will have a trauma patient, you'll fix the tibia or something, uh, the tib fib fracture, and they have foot drop. Don't forget that sometimes, because of swelling, you can get peri common perineal nerve compression. So thinking about decompression, also a very simple procedure, very safe, very predictable, can help. And here we had a nerve test that confirmed uh, a blockage, but it's a clinical exam finding. And uh, this just shows the technique and, and what to look for. And this is the patient after mm -hmm. ha had complete uh, foot drop. This is maybe a month or two later um, after a decompression. Mm -hmm. Last but not least, I want to uh, say a few words about refinement. So, you know, you've saved the limb. You'd be surprised how many of these patients actually come back and it needs some more work. Um, because it affects their body image and so forth, or it's just too bulky, for instance, the, the flap you put on and they're not happy with it, or you, as I showed you, there's animation deformity where the muscle twitches, that can be painful and so forth. So a few words about these refinements, just to, to um, give you the long-term uh, perspective on these patients. This is, you recognize this, this is the lady who had um, gastro flap, the soleus flap, and the free flap. And we took her back. I've taken her back three times, I think, now. And I've removed some of the graft and done a primary closure, a small rearrangement of tissue. I did liposuction to thin the flap. I took the fat and injected it in here. So, I mean, we've done a lot of work. This shows you fat grafting. So you suck the fat out, and then you can use it. I used it here on a finger. Um, this is what it looks like to just the patient was unhappy with the um, discomfort. The, there was a skin graft on the extensor tendon. It was too tight. And I used fat grafting to fix that problem. This is another patient where you can inject fat into the tissues to make them more subtle. Um, this is the same patient from earlier where I injected the fat between the skin graft and the muscle because she was bothered by the, the tightness of it. And it helped. Uh, this is another patient where you can inject fat uh, into the tissue to solve difficult reconstructive problems like this after a steroid injection, full correction, and the patient uh, has a normal appearance and normal function, more importantly. Another example, 
this is something you'll encounter a lot is um, unstable soft tissues on a below the knee amputation stump or um, a, a transfemoral amputation. And this is the problem. Again, you release it, fat injection into the area, and you go from this to this. Patient's happy, no pain, and so forth. I hope this was helpful. Um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. This is a, this is a um, quotation that um, I keep close to my heart, and um, I, it may be helpful to you. Um, uh, Abdul Baha wrote in the early 20th century, we must now highly resolve to arise and lay hold of all those instrumentalities that promote the peace and well-being and happiness, the knowledge, culture, and industry, the dignity, value, and station of the entire human race. Thank you so much. <laughs>